Thank you for joining us. My name is Julie Willis and I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded land on which we work, learn and live, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung peoples. We pay respects to Elders past, present and future and acknowledge the importance of Indigenous knowledges in the Academy. I'd also like to thank Dr Mandy Nicholson and the Jiri Jiri Dance Group for their welcome to country earlier this evening in the Dulux Gallery. Tonight we present the first Dean's Lecture Series for 2024, Planning the End of the World, Indigenous Urbanism and the Art of Refusal, with guest lecturer, Assistant Professor Heather Dorries. And firstly, a few words about Heather. She's been jointly appointed as an Assistant Professor to both the Department of Geography and Planning and the Centre for Indigenous Studies at the University of Toronto. Her research focused on the dynamic interplay between resurgent Indigenous world making and the violence of settler colonial urbanisation. Specifically, how settler colonialism is supported by urban planning processes. Her work also considers how Indigenous intellectual traditions, including Indigenous environmental knowledge, legal orders and cultural production, can be applied to anti-colonial planning practices. Through this important work, Heather is revealing the theoretical and methodological frameworks for a truly transformative approach to urban planning. Her forthcoming book exploring these issues is titled Planning Without Property, Relational Practices of Being and Belonging. Her lecture tonight will focus on alternative Indigenous methods of urban planning, moving beyond housing as a colonial capitalist concept, prioritising living well for all while advancing Indigenous justice. Her lecture asks us to consider what we should do when home is a commodity and homelessness is reduced to a violation of property rights. Using examples from her hometown of Toronto, she'll explain how Indigenous knowledge can revitalise our cities while also tackling homelessness and community displacement. Heather, we look forward to learning from you. Welcome. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be here with you tonight. Um, and there's so many people who have helped make this visit possible. Uh, Dean Willis, the Melbourne School of Design um, and the City of Melbourne and uh, Aboriginal uh, Melbourne who have made this talk possible. And I'd also really like to thank um, Kathy Oak and Rosanna Verde, who've been taking really good care of me, organizing all the details of my visit. Um, and I, I want to thank them especially. Before I begin, there's a few clarifications I feel that I should make. Um, first of all, I'm a person of Anishinaabe and settler descent. And so when possible, I draw on Anishinaabe worldviews to talk about um, my understandings of Indigenous urbanism. However, in doing that, I really only speak on behalf of myself and not anyone else. Um, you'll also notice that in this talk, I use the term Indigenous when I speak in general terms um, to talk about peoples whose existence has been shaped by ongoing resistance to colonialism. But I also realize that there's some differences between the ways these these terms are used um, in Australia and, and Canada, despite our many commonalities. Um, and so you'll notice, I, I understand that the term First Nations has become more popular in Australia. And this is a term that has a very specific legal meaning in Canada. So it's it's not a term I use often, except when I'm, I'm um, using it in that specific constitutional sense. Wakaganong ta pagashinon, nin dakimanan ka gije oga ahindinas. These are words that were spray painted on the walls of the main freeway which cuts through Ottawa, and they're the work of Ogima Mikina, 
which is a collective founded by Anishinaabe artists Susan Blight and Hayden King. Recognizing that Indigenous peoples and histories have often been erased from urban space, Oyima Mikina creates reminders of Indigenous presence by renaming streets, recreating historic plaques, and installing billboards featuring, featuring Indigenous languages, histories, and place names. And they often do this in a very covert and cheeky way. And as they put it, these works draw on Indigenous language, philosophy, and diplomacy to challenge, reflect on, and operationalize the concepts of reconciliation and decolonization. Wakaganang tapagishanang ninda kimanan ki kajige oga ahindinas. These words translate as these walls shall crumble, our land remains. And they're far more than just a commentary on the freeway, which has since been destroyed and replaced. These words are a reminder that Ottawa is situated on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin. And as Ogima Mikina explains, these words are a reminder that, quote, the Anishinaabe endure. We do so through settler colonial time and across space. We do so in contentious, in contention. To be indigenous in the city is to, is, is to struggle for recognition, to be seen, and to resist the erasure that is so often common in Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, etc. Yet, with recognition also comes appropriation and co-optation. In this unease, we consider the benefits of erasure, or at least covert movement. Against this crumbling wall, we re reclaim space for an anti-recognition to speak to each other as Anishinaabeg, as communities pushed out by gentrification, as the colonized, and offer a refrain and a sign of defiance." End quote. I've chosen this example to begin this talk because I think that like this freeway, <laughs> that is crumbling and, and has since been torn down, planning theory has been undergoing a process of deconstruction. And so in this talk, I want to address some of the ways that Indigenous intellectual traditions, as expressed in art, cultural production, and scholarship, can inform alternative planning practices. Planning theorists have begun to recognize planning's entanglements with settler colonialism and to grapple with the question of how planning theories and practices might be decolonized. However, indigenous perspectives and intellectual traditions have often been absent from these discussions, particularly when it comes to how these how this might be enacted in practice. And it's something that I witness often in the Canadian context. With few exceptions, the work of Indigenous scholars and scholars working in the field of Indigenous studies who are, might be best positioned to envision a decolonized approach to planning have been conspicuously absent from these discussions, whether in the academy or in practice. In the Canadian context, Many of the interventions suggested by planners and policymakers have emphasized reforms such as consultation or inclusion, which rely on state recognition for securing Indigenous rights. And these are important discussions. Reforming planning frameworks and practices may offer some gains for Indigenous communities through the recognition of Indigenous rights, and may reduce conflict by offering Indigenous peoples greater influence in the creation of plans and policies. So it's important to have these discussions. But at the same time, state recognition as the sole basis for Indigenous justice takes us down a difficult path. Right? Dene scholar Glenn Coulthard has criticized the way that recognition subordinates Indigenous claims to sovereignty, to the authority of the state, and fail to transcend a colonial set of relations. 
Within the field of Indigenous studies, the concept of refusal has emerged as a powerful rejoinder to the politics of recognition. If recognition carries with it the danger of capitulation, then the refusal of recognition is not only a strategic positioning, but also a mechanism for other possibilities. Mohawk scholar Audra Simpson explains that refusal signals not only the withdrawal of consent, but implies the avenging of a prior injustice and pointing to its ongoing life in the present. Or as Eve Tuck and Edward Yang explain, refusal is not just a no, but a redirection towards ideas otherwise unacknowledged or unquestioned. The intellectual challenge that planning faces about, is about more than simply expanding planning's epistemological framework. It's also about challenging the fundamental assumptions and worldviews upon which planning relies. Frantz Fanon wrote that challenging the colonial world is not a rational confrontation of viewpoints. It is not a discourse on the universal, but the impassioned claim by the colonized that their world is fundamentally different. In my work, I look to the knowledge expressed in indigenous cultural production, like you've just seen tonight in the brilliant work of Mandy Nicholson, looking to the, the kind of inspiration that this work can provide for imagining futures beyond colonialism, as well as approaches to planning that do not center the settler colonial state, European knowledge, or non-Indigenous peoples as the drivers of Indigenous liberation. Anishinaabe curator Wanda Nanabush explains that Indigenous art is inherently political. Our art forms are never separate from our political forms. So decolonial aesthetics is a term which describes the ways in which indigenous artists and creators remix media, aesthetics, and modes of expression to refuse the constraints of colonial narratives on creative production and reorient us towards other possibilities and ways of being. And I think it's important to point out that this is not about including indigenous art or aesthetics as a window dressing or decoration in urban development projects. You know, some scholarship on indigenous urban planning has advocated for greater inclusion of indigenous art and place names in the design of urban places. And this is important work. But decolonial aesthetics is not simply about including indigenous art in placemaking. Instead, it's a way of anchoring place to a broader political agenda of indigenous self-determination. Decolonial help aesthetics helps to set this agenda and it sets an agenda for anti-colonial and decolonial approaches to planning while expanding planning's political imagination. And I think, I think to do this work, we have to start right at the beginning, right? We have to ask the question, what is planning for? And I think indigenous epistemology, epistemologies help to challenge and reframe ideas about what planning is for, who it's for, and what it might be. One of the most pervasive ideas about planning that I've encountered is the idea that Planning is about creating the conditions for living well. And if you look, I think, at the mission statement of most professional planning bodies, they're going to contain words like the ones you say, see here, which is from the uh, American Planning Association, contain statements about making cities for people, or creating the economic, social, and ec uh, ecological conditions for growth and development, for public benefit. And these statements often emphasize the economic function of planning, framing planning outcomes in economic terms. I mean, these are good statements, but I think they orient us towards a very specific and often narrow vision of what planning is and what it can do. 
I am really indebted to the groundbreaking work that Libby Porter has done to demonstrate how planning's commitment to property and the culture that revolves around property ownership accounts for planning's entanglements with colonialism. So property is really important to planning. Property is also an embodiment of how humans relate to the world. The ownership model of property relies on a worldview that understands people and land and land and bodies to be distinct, ontologically distinct, rather than intimately connected through relations of dependence. John Locke's account of property, for example, which is commonly recounted in discussions of property, relies on the creation story recounted in Genesis to explain that property is created when humans invest their labor and land through cultivation and improvement. According to this story, humans are in a position of domination over the land and are morally obliged to, quote, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground, as Genesis instructs. According to this framework, laboring to create property is not just a right, but it also a duty of responsible individuals. And it's this position of domination over the land that enables the creation of property. Yet, under settler colonialism, racial hierarchies and racial regimes of property determine that not everyone is accorded rights of ownership over their labor or freedom over their bodies. My research has demonstrated how planning in Canada relies on a racist and sexist legal regime which establishes and maintains this racial hierarchy and which planning in inherits and mobilizes in its practices. And this, the consequences and the spatialization of this racial hierarchy are very well apparent in cities. It results in the underdevelopment of racialized neighborhoods, the under and defunding of housing, transportation, recreation facilities, and a variety of other services typically falling, falling within the domain of planning and which we all require in order to live well in the city. As a consequence of these inequities, cities not only fail to provide, but also often withhold the requirements of life from the most vulnerable people. Reflecting on multiple forms of urban displacement that target racialized people, geographer Mia Dawson observes that planning and policy produce the routinization of death that, quote, reiterates a racial geography of entrenched segregation and enclosure of wealth. So in the context of settler colonialism, despite our purported commitments to creating the conditions for living well, planning is also often a project about death. I want to talk about a different creation story Indigenous intellectual traditions offer alternatives to the assumptions upon which the racial property regime relies. Indigenous ontologies challenge the worldview that positions people and land as distinct and instead emphasize interconnectedness of the human and more than human worlds. So Indigenous co cosmologies are focused on the creation of the conditions for sustaining and supporting life. And the ethics of life that are so important to these worldviews are evident in the story of Sky Woman and the creation of the world, which are foundational to Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee cosmologies. The story of Sky Woman explains how Sky Woman fell from the sky world to a watery world below. And it tells how she struggled in this water, right? She had no place to rest. It tells how all of the animals work together to find a place for Sky Woman to rest and how the smallest muskrat made the greatest contribution diving deep underwater to find a small piece of earth which he placed on the back of a turtle. 
And it tells how Sky Woman danced in gratitude and through her dancing transformed this small piece of earth into Turtle Island. So the, the land grew as she danced in gratitude. And the seed gifts she brought with her from the sky world became all of the plant life on Turtle Island. In contrast to the account of creation provided in Genesis, which envisions the creation of property through the investment of human agency in animate land, in this creation story, we see how humans derive their agency from the agency already possessed by land and more than human kin. So in this story, humans are actually the least powerful right, of all the beings. And this story reminds us that life can only be, be sustained by a dense web of land-based relations. In Anishinaabe Moen, the Anishinaabe language, this principle of relationality is expressed through the word inawendewen, relating. Anishinaabe scholar Nicholas Rio explains that inawendewen is our way of relating to each other and all of creation. Quote, is a, it is an all-inclusive relationship that honors the interconnectedness of all our relations. Because humans rely on these relations for survival, human agency must be regarded as an extension of the more than human world or natural world. And this framework does not simply value more than human beings, but rather places these beings at the center of an ethical political ontology. So with an Anishinaabe cosmology, land is understood as, this, as the set of life-giving relations rather than as an object subject to human domination or to commodification. This concept of relationality is at the core of the idea of minobamatsuin, or living well in the world. Anishinaabe scholar Deborah McGregor explains that minobamatsuin is not simply about well-being, but also refers to the totality of relations that are required to sustain life and our obligations as beings to help sustain those relations. And these relations are sustained by principles such as mutuality, respect, and reciprocity. And caring for, maintaining, and balancing these relations are all necessary in order to live well. So an approach to planning based on principles of relationality provides an alternative to forms of planning based on relations of dominance. And Anishinaabe have practiced these principles since time immemorial. Planning founded on relationality seeks to identify and strengthen the practices that allow us to locate ourselves within the web of relationality that makes life possible. Planning founded on relationality focuses on the purposeful creation of conditions that sustain life in community, where community includes all forms of life, human and more than human, that live together. And this approach situates the flourishing of life as its highest goal. I want to turn now to another example of decolonial aesthetics. This work is called Overture, and it's the work of Anishinaabe artist Lisa Myers. This is a work that was uh, displayed in Toronto's Union Station during the summer of 2022. And this is the main station for commuter and long distance rail travel in Toronto. So this work overture would have seen, been seen by many people on a daily basis. In this work, you see the words over asking and overtaking printed in purple pigment, which are derived from blueberries. Lisa Myers created this work during COVID-19, during the COVID-19 pandemic at a time when issues related to housing, homelessness, and staying home were all particularly salient. And the words over asking might ring familiar to anyone with an understanding of Toronto's real estate market. And I don't know if you have the same kind of gleeful celebration of the of houses selling for more than the, the sellers were. Or requesting, but this is something that you'll see 
printed on for sale signs in the front yards of uh, recently sold homes in Toronto. So they'll, they'll have the sign for sale and then when it sells, they'll, they'll put a bigger sign that says sold for over asking, right? And it's, it's really celebratory. <laughs> um, and I, I think these words, you know, remind us and invite us to reflect on the relations and the kind of relations of, of domination and exploitation that fuel this real estate market and that render both people and land exploitable with this exploitable un, this exploitation understood as normal and even desirable insofar as it serves the accumulation of capital and economic growth. Settler colonialism has been described as a project of homemaking. For settlers, the making of home would not be possible without the dispossession of indigenous people. And so in this section, I wanna discuss how homelessness is naturalized and criminalized through an understanding of home and housing that position, position dispossession as part of a normal and desirable process. So Toronto, like Melbourne and many other cities around the world is experiencing a, an acute housing crisis. We have an incredibly expensive housing market. Several major banks have warned that the city's housing market is overvalued and most likely constitutes a bubble. You know, we ha haven't built, um, we've built very little public housing over the past, past 30 years. Um, and this has created a um, situation of, of deep crisis, I think much like the, the situation in Melbourne. And Canadian social policy has played an important part in creating this demand for housing through a strategy of what some scholars have called asset-based welfare that encourages people to acquire property and other financial assets rather than relying on social welfare programs for economic security. This kind of financialization has positioned both homeowners and homes as financially exploitable. As Manuel Albers observes, this financialization of home requires more and more households to see acquiring a house, not just as a home, as a place to live, but as an investment, as something to put equity into and take equity from. This exploitation of home and the housing crisis it produces relies on the same dispossessory logics that drive colonialism. So in this sense, settler colonialism is a, one of the conditions of possibility for cap, the capitalist urbanization that drives the homelessness crisis. Crises are no, are, are very familiar to urban, urban scholars. Um, Harvey explains that capitalism produces several crises, including a crisis of accumulation and overproduction. So producing more goods and services beyond what can be consumed in the market. And this can result in economic downturns. Capitalism overcomes these crises through what David Harvey calls a spatial fix. The spatial fix can be understood as, quote, the geographical expansion and geographical geographical restructuring, which is achieved through fixing investments spatially, embedding them in land to create an entirely new landscape. So things like airports or cities, for example, and all of this serves capital accumulation. So in other words, as capital is applied to urban expansion and the creation of new infrastructures, capital affects new forms of spatial reorganization that allows the, these crises of capital to be managed. This is a concept that has proven enormously useful in urban studies for explaining how capitalism produces urban phenomena, including urban growth, restructuring, gentrification, suburbanization. And it also explains the occurrence of uneven development in the, geopolitical tensions as capital flows and investments are unevenly distributed across regions. So while Marxist urban scholarship acknowledges that patterns of uneven development are most strongly felt by racialized communities, 
the production of racial and eco economic inequality as explained by Marxism is often viewed as incidental to capitalist growth rather than a part and parcel of the ways that it functions. Scholars working in the black radical tradition have sharpened this understanding of the relationship between racism and capitalism and emphasize that inequality is in fact a requirement of growth rather than merely incidental to it. As Jody Melamed explains, capital can only be capital when it is accumulating and it can only accumulate by producing and moving through relations of severe inequality amongst human groups. These antimonies of accumulation require loss, disposability, and unequal differentiation of human value. And racism enshrines the, these inequalities which capitalism requires. In this context of settler colonialism, urban develop uh, settler colonialism serves as a spatial fix by providing new territories for resource extraction, land exploitation, and market expansion, thus addressing capitalism's need for continual growth. So in the context of settler colonialism, urban development and spatial restructuring address these contradictions and crises inherent in racial capitalism while also reinforcing and reproducing racial hierarchies. So that's the theory. Let me show you how this might be applied to analyzing an actual situation. And I think this becomes really evident when we look at the, the homelessness crises that emerged and intensified during the, the COVID pandemic. During the pandemic, some of the perversions of this commodified housing market became stunningly apparent in Toronto as the number of people who were living outside increased dramatically. Since the start of the pandemic, the number of people living outside rose dramatically. Over 50 encampments were created in downtown Toronto with large, three large encampments located in parks within the city's core accounting for about half of all people living outside. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm sure you can imagine that one of the reasons this was happening was not only was the number of people being evicted from their homes increasing, but then when people had had the choice of going to uh, a shelter, right, where they had a very high chance of catching the, the COVID virus, the, the other option was, of course, staying outside. And pe so people were opting for that option. Um, out of perceived safety reasons. About 60% of all people experiencing homelessness are members of racialized groups. So despite compro comprising less than 3% of the total population in Toronto, Indigenous peoples account for about a quarter of all people staying outdoors in encampments. Um, and about a third of people who are experiencing homelessness identified are, are identify as black. So it's a very highly racialized population. Toronto city bylaws expressly prohibit camping or even setting up a tent in parks. So this means that staying in a tent in a park is illegal. Fearing the enforcement of this bylaw and eventual evictions, a coalition of people who are living outside in parks and the agencies serving this, this group of people applied for a court injunction, hoping that they could prevent the, this bylaw from being enforced for the duration of the pandemic. Um, they were unsuccessful. Ultimately, the judge who ruled, ruled against this coalition arguing that parks are public resources that are intended to be available and used by any everyone. And so the, this, this discourse of the this living in parks being a huge incursion on a public right to a public space was really what drove a lot of the decision making, I think, around the, this problem of 
um, people live or this issue of people living in parks in Toronto. What's interesting about this is that the regulation of park space in Toronto relies on the legal principle of trespass. This principle in turn re relies on a, a set of understandings about private property. So trespass is a violation of private property rights. So using these trespass bylaws positions parks and in fact all city spaces, the, the private property of the city. So claiming parks as the private pro property of the city implicitly draws a set of distinctions between who has the right to the space and who is criminalized in the park, um, as well as who is right, a rightfully part of a deserving public when measures pres for preserving par pu public rights to use park space are weighed. So these trespass bylaws position the city and this purported public as rights bearing subjects with legally protected entitlements to public space. However, it also excludes people ex experiencing homelessness from this category of the public and renders them non-citizens unentitled to urban space. So this evictions demonstrates the power of racial capitalism to delimit its subjects and objects in order to determine their value. So in June 2021, the City of, of Toronto Council adopted a, a so-called zero encampment policy, right, in response to this perceived problem of people living in the parks. And this paved the way for the violent eviction of people living in parks, and they targeted the three main encampments in the center of the city. This eviction was violent. It was conducted by police on horseback. Residents were given two hours to collect their belongings. They were given the option to take um, shelter in one of the city's designated shelter hotels. And those who did not leave were arrested. I, I think what's ironic or troubling about this action is that the city spent nearly two million dollars or about thirty three thousand um, dollars per homeless person evicted in this action so that's an amount of money that could easily pay for uh, you know more than a year of rent for, for any one of these people Discussions related to housing and homelessness have essentially focused on this question of how and where people are sheltered during the night, right? So are they in the park or not? Should they be in the park or not? And I really think this is the wrong question to be asking. Returning to Indigenous ideas and cosmologies, Indigenous scholars provide us with a much more expansive under, understanding of what home is and what, home, what causes homelessness. Uh, one example is the work of Métis scholar Jesse Thistle, who provides a comprehensive perspective on Indigenous homelessness, expanding it beyond this kind of conventional understanding of homelessness as simply being the state of lacking a shelter. He focuses on the social, mental, physical, and spiritual dimensions of home. And he underscores that homelessness is not solely about the absence of physical shelter, but also in, involves the deprivation of those conditions that are necessary for life. So from this perspective, home, having a home means being able to benefit from life in community and from the life-giving resources that community can provide. The homelessness described by Thistle is not just about being without shelter, but being disconnected from the social and spiritual elements of home and forms of displacement that prevent people from living well. One of the kinds of homelessness he describes uh, is the homelessness that stemmed from the residential school system. This is a school system that ran in Canada for over a hundred years in, into the 1980s. It was a, a church run and government supported system that's forcefully removed children from their home communities in order to purposefully sever ties to language, 
culture, kinship, and territory. And it made children homeless through territorial disconnection. And it was not just a tool of in assimilation, but was designed to produce the wholesale dispossession of indigenous communities in the service of settler colonialism. In October 2022, the city of Toronto announced, I mean, very separate from this other, these other issues that were ha happening in the parks, they announced that they would open three designated sites in Toronto parks for Indigenous peoples to hold sacred fire ceremonies. And they did this in order to make good on the, the commitments that they had made in the City of Toronto Rec Reconciliation Action Plan. And this announcement was made, of course, only a few months after these violent homeless encampment clearances. Um, you know, I could talk in detail about the, this, the policy that was introduced, but I'll say in general, it took a very managerial approach to managing sacred fire sites as it does to many other aspects of part park management. The permitting process was quite narrow. It only allowed fires to be run by recognized agencies or groups that had been vetted by the city of Toronto and in, according to guidelines that were set by the city and in specific places established by the city. Um, and in some, the reg regulations were quite prescript prescriptive and restrictive in terms of how they made fires possible. Ultimately, this doesn't matter because the program was canceled only a few months after it had started. However, in one of the parks, fires have nevertheless burned continuously for over a year, you know, despite the cancellation of this program. I don't have a picture of this site because they've asked not to be photographed, but the site is very special. They have two teepee structures, um, where the fires are kept. Um, and in, in doing this and in maintaining these fires through a grassroots effort led by community members, not by any organized group or agency, um, you know, they, they are providing warmth, they're providing advice, they're providing shelter and other forms of informal support through a, a real ethic of care and harm reduction. And you know, the, this has given rise to discussions um, amongst people who are now calling themselves a, the Toronto Indigenous Land Trust to have a vision for decommodifying and providing uh, more stable housing for Indigenous-led housing in Toronto. And so I, I wanna draw attention to these efforts not to kind of romanticize homelessness encampments and the, the kinds of activities that go on there, but I do want to highlight that alternatives are possible, right? Even in the, the face of restrictive policies and all sorts of efforts that are being made to, to keep people from engaging in these kinds of activities, right? Engaging in making connections with community and territory. I wanna return um, to kind of finish up, I want to return briefly to Lisa Meyer's overture. In a, because I think in addition to problematizing the relationship between financialized, the financialized housing market and the problems of dispossession, this work also offers some clues to other ways that making home is connected to the originary violence of settler colonialism, as well as thinking about how home is made. The ink that's used to print these words over asking and overtaking is made from blueberry pigment that Lisa makes herself. Um, and in printing these words, I think she's also drawing our attention to the Anishinaabe word for land, a key, which is bolded in the word taking and which, uh, which is a little bit easier to see in person. Blueberry pigment is something that um, Lisa Myers has used in many of her artworks. Um, in, and in some of the works she used 
uses these pigments to create maps from family stories, and she calls these works her blueprints. She explains, quote, I call these maps blueprints as I believe that stories and the things we witness are like blueprints as they inform how we locate ourselves and retain a sense of belonging through straining the berries and encouraging absorption into wood and paper materials, the pigment maps its own forms. And the metaphor of straining and absorbing recalls ways to survive through trauma, displacement, and oppression. Blueberries are um, a, wonderful, a wonderful thing. It, they're a berry that you find throughout the territories of the Anishinaabeg. And the arrival of blueberries and other sorts of berries marks the beginning of summer. The month associated with summer equinox is called Mingizis or berry moon because it's when all the berries start to come out. Berry picking is a practice that activates relations to land through food and stories. Knowing where to find berries requires an understanding of the land. It requires understanding where they will grow, what they like. Knowing how to pick the ripest berries requires an understanding of the plant. And our aunties might share the best recipes for pre preparing blueberries with us. Blueberry pigment is the foundational medium for the work Blueprints for a Long Walk that Lisa Myers made while reflecting on her maternal grandfather's experience attending residential school. He eventually ran away from the school and walked roughly 250 kilometers in order to return to his home. Myers recreated this walk in 2012 and she explains that this was a way of finding myself in that story. Finding ourselves in the story of colonialism also requires finding ourselves in relation to land. Understanding ourselves, our place in the world and our obligations to land begins with an understanding that we are all related to each other and to the more than human world. And these are the relations that will not only allow us to survive, but allow us to come home. Unsettling colonial planning processes require rethinking planning and what it is for. Decolonization will not be brought about by reforming existing planning frameworks. Instead, resisting colonial planning requires refusing planning as it is presently understood. In other words, planning the end of the colonial world requires planning the end of planning as we know it. And I realized this proposition might provoke anxiety for some, especially non-Indigenous people. And perhaps you're asking if planning the end of settler colonialism requires the end of planning as we know it, what's left? Where does that leave us? Where do we go? Eve Tuck and Edward Yang caution that focusing our attention on what, they, on what we might call settler normacy, normalcy or settler futurity we focus on these questions, we will not arrive at an understanding of what a decolonial future means for Indigenous people. We will not arrive at this future if we're preoccupied with describing what it means for settlers. So rather than describing what a future means for settlers, I suggest that the decolonial project in planning would be well served by refusing this settler futurity. And this is a refusal to answer questions such as what happens next? What does decolonization mean for non-Indigenous people or planners? Or what are examples of Indigenous communities and non-Indigenous communities planning together? Instead, I think that anyone interested in, in advancing a decolonial project in planning would be more effectively served by a different set of questions. And these questions might be, what obligations do I owe to the peoples of the territories I occupy? How do I locate myself in the web of relationality that makes life possible? What role will I play in creating forms of social organization 
or approaches to planning that are anti-oppressive. I see the task of planning the end of the world as a hopeful task, a project grounded in the belief that different ways of relating make a different world possible. Indigenous peoples are already enacting alternatives, rejecting and refusing the options that colonialism has offered. Refusal creates a space for imagining and enacting possibilities for other forms of life. As indigenous scholars, creators, and communities show us, these possibilities are already at hand. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you, Heather, for an absolutely fascinating lecture. Um, the, the resonance between what you're describing in Toronto uh, and the situations in Australia and across the Pacific um, really, really speak to how um, Indigenous ways of knowing can teach us so much about what we need to do uh, with the world going forward. I'd like now to invite Jason Eads, Director, Aboriginal Melbourne, and Dr. Mandy Nicholson, lecturer of First Nations Design with the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning, to each say a few words on Indigenous urbanism in a Melbourne context. Thank you. That was like really thinking of Australia and how Australia is, is exactly the same. Um, but I wanted to just briefly talk about the perspective here in NAM in Melbourne and how working with architects and planners over the many years that I've been an artist, where the journey has really focused on the visual uh, beauty of creating artworks for arch architectural plans that have already been developed. And it's backwards because we need to be as First Nations people and artists and human beings and knowledge holders right at the very beginning of the planning process we need to create relationships of trust because we've had so much stuff taken from us. We need to gain trust from those that want our cultural information and how that is respected. In One really good way to do that is to get the First Nation people to actually author, produce, manage, create that project from the very beginning. Before or even just after you've created that relationship of friendship before you even start thinking about creating uh, a plan to create something at the end. The journey isn't that straight line. It's that most important part is the relationship building and then understanding that the planning process isn't, here's the beginning, here's the end, and that that's it. it you, the big bubble here is the relationship. All along this journey is the relationship continuing and growing stronger. So you may have start off straight and then it goes backwards and it goes around here and then it pauses, then there's sorry business that doesn't happen for three months, then all over the place, up and down, backwards. But the journey is the key to coming up with something that's mutually beneficial, not just here's a big, uh, beautiful project that we worked with some First Nations people. It's actually designed by those First Nations people. Get them, get us on board before you even think of creating something because the outcome will be so much more res respectful and so much more character building for those people that are designers and planners because the information that you include in your projects is coming from the first knowledges of place, the first knowledges of this, what we now call Melbourne, it's Nam, it's, which means bushland and how we manage and uh, how we manicure the environment on a physical scale, but also our spiritual uh, way of being. So the fire thing stood out to me, and sadly that project ended, like why was it even, yeah, that made me wild. But we have to have permits to light fires. And the course that we're doing at the moment that we're lecturing in, is all about uh, how do we engage with First Nations people? How do we use knowledges? Whose narrative is it? How much information you can use? And the I did this on purpose to, for the poor students. At the end, the outcome is to create a culturally safe space where I can practice my culture. And it's gonna be hard and it's on purpose, but we'll guide them through that. 
but that'll open their eyes to understanding, wow, it is really hard. So I won't, I won't, I'll let you have a go now, but thank you so much, Heather, for all your beautiful lecture. Thank you, um, Mandy. And before I um, do make some comments, I do want to say, I think the work that you are doing personally is incredible in this space. And um, I look forward to what you um, are able to do here within the university and its future students. So congrats. Um, Heather, um, it is this deja vu of sitting through and listening to you talk, the Australian experience continually just was popping off in my head. So my name's Jason Eads. I'm the Director of Aboriginal Melbourne at the City of Melbourne. I am not a planner, but I do spend a lot of my time in discussions with planners um, about this great city. But for me, one of the most important things, and I guess um, the reason why it was a no-brainer for me to support this um, particular lecture is the role of truth-telling and the role that we need to lean into in order to unearth that truth. Because systems won't change until we acknowledge and accept. And that's the big challenge that we have. At the City of Melbourne, we're doing a project at the moment that's looking back at the past of the city and its establishment. And it's the very planning laws and the way in which they've been used to displace, to move people out of Melbourne in order to give property rights to others. I know in talking to Wurundjeri people that colonisation here was brutal and fast. And so for us, as we reflect upon Heather's lecture, I ask you to also think about the Australian experience, to really think about where we're at as a country and the things that we need to do in order to shift how we think about place in particular. I think it was last week, maybe the week before, I attended a homelessness advisory committee for the city. Sitting in that, in that meeting were a range of people, including some of my own community, who are or have had um, experience of rough sleeping in our city. Um, but the thing that really jumped out to me wasn't the absence of four walls. It wasn't the, you know, we need an apartment or we need a house to call our own. People were speaking about the role of place and a role of that place to make them feel welcome, to make them feel at home, regardless of where they are. I think that's something that we've got to really reflect upon here in Australia in particular. And I know, you know, the, the history of colonisation around the world is to bring in what looks like from other places of the world. They don't naturally fit within our environments. Hands up who lives in a Victorian terrace house um, that struggles with the Australian summer. We have legacies that have been brought to us from other places. We're yet to properly figure out how do we work with our traditional owners to really understand this place and actually design a city that is more in harmony with that landscape than what it is at odds with us. So Heather, thank you for, for coming and making this great journey. Um, I look forward to having further discussions later in the week when you join myself and some other colleagues. Um, but to all of you, thank you for, for coming along and um, honestly entering into this discussion as people in Australia who will go back and think about implications of planning, whether you be a student or whether you be people working in the profession. What Heather is talking about exists right here in many instances in the same way. Those camps, during COVID, um, lots of people were um, moved or displaced. Um, we have camp sovereignty right now down at um, King's Domain, who in some ways um, are kind of voicing some of the, the stuff that we heard um, in, in relation to the fires um, in, in Canada. But I can go on and on and provide examples of that. But again, I just really hope that people reflect. So again, thank you all for, for coming. Um, and I'll hand back over. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Jason, and thank you so much, Mandy, for your responses. Uh, before we wrap up, and I'm hoping they will appear on the slides in front of me, uh, in front of you, above me, um, I want to mention a couple of our current and upcoming events here in the faculty. Of course, many of you will have been at the launch earlier this evening for Bagrug Ol Bigul, She is of Country, um, which invites you to experience country through the eyes of Dr. Mandy Nicholson. And the important, uh, this exhibition is an important survey of work curated by Mandy, who is a Wurundjeri artist and traditional custodian of Nam. At 6.30 p.m. on April the 9th, we're also holding a special public lecture, State Space and Lived Lives at the Colonial Margins, presented by Dr. Tanya Sangupta from the Bartlett School of Architecture at University College London. Tanya's visit is supported by the McGeorge Bequest at the University of Melbourne. And our next Dean's Lecture will be presented by Anna Milaki from MIT's renowned Critical Broadcasting Lab on the topic of collective repair at 7 p.m. on Tuesday the 16th of April. Please head to our website for more details on these and all of our upcoming events. Thank you all for coming and I wish you a good evening.